Yeah, I'm going to talk about, this is one of my favorite projects I, I, that I've ever done. Uh, and actually, we're going to not just talk about the roller crimper, but when I was asked to come speak here, they, they, um, they also asked that we talk about an interceder we built in the lab as well. Uh, so with that, you should know a few things about myself and the other gentleman here, Mike Bredesen. Uh, we're the ones that built this project. Uh, but we're not experts. Uh, we are trained entomologists, so I study insects for a living. That's what I do for a job. And I grew up on a farm, but neither one of us has a machining background. We had never taken a shop class in high school. So we don't know what we're doing, but we somehow muddled our way through this, and we both work for Exysis. And we did that with the help of a lot of farmers that guided us along the way. So what I'm going to be telling you guys today is a way to accomplish this, but it's certainly not the only way. It's probably not even the best way to do it, but it works. And so that's, that's what we're going to cover here today. And I will promise to have you guys out. Uh, we'll have time for questions before the 11 o'clock hour when we all want to go hear the the next speaker in the main hall. So I'm going to start off today. This was the interceder build. And this was the interceder we made. And some things to notice on this piece of equipment. This was built not for the purpose of uh, interceding cover crops over 1,000 acres. This was built to basically intercede a small research project that we wanted to do at the lab. And the only way to get that done is we had to build our own. So, and this one was not part of the SARE funded project, so we don't have a lot of photos. We didn't document this. We just wanted to make it happen. But luckily, it's a pretty simple machine. Uh, and so we'll quickly go over what we did. Uh, and like I said, we're not experts at building things, so we kept it simple. So what we did is we talked to a couple local farmers we asked them, how do we do this? And that one of them donated some Gandhi boxes to us. So then all we had to do was basically come up with row units and a way to attach them onto a machine, and we were in business. So they suggested no-till drill row units. We specifically went with the hay buster. The reason we liked that no-till drill is because it doesn't have to be a hay buster, but that's what we found in a scrap yard. It had the double disc openers, and that was really important for the project that we were running. It doesn't necessarily have to be if you got something else, uh, but we like the, no di the double disc openers because they, they let us get into the, the ground really nicely uh, and opened up the furrow a little bit better, especially when we were planting a really diverse cover crop with really small seeds. It really opened it up nicely. The other thing that we liked about this drill and the row units is you'll see they're very simple and they're just bolted onto a toolbar, uh, which made it really easy for us to snag off at the salvage yard uh, and attach to a cultivator bar that we found. So we just found, you know, for our toolbar to put these row units on, we found an old international cultivator on a three point hitch and we said that's basically You'll see here, that's our toolbar on a three-point hitch. It's pretty much exactly how the, the hay buster drill had them attached. So we're not going to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. This whole setup right here, uh, this was 2018 scrap prices, cost about 250 bucks to get this done. Uh, we did have to uh, get a few new bearings in the, in the openers and stuff, so that added a few extra bucks on there as well. Uh, but pretty cheaply done, and that's kind of the theme of all the equipment we build. We're not rolling in the money, so we kind of do it cheaply. And so once we had the row units on our cultivator bar, it was attached, the, the Gandhi box is there. Those are 100 pound. Um, those hold 100 pounds each of seed, those Gandhi boxes, and they have four hookups on them to go to four row units each. So we only have a seven unit dis, uh, uh, interseeder. Uh, again, this was not, if you're looking for something that goes on a thousand acres, you're probably not gonna want this. You can do a couple hundred acres in a year on this, 
but don't be looking for something. You'll have to expand a little bit better. And last I checked this week, these Gandy boxes are going for about 1200 bucks right now. So two of them for this, you know, cost you 2400 bucks plus the 250 for the scrap metal or the scrap parts and the row units and stuff. So you're looking under a $3,000 for your own interceder. Uh, problems with this unit, again, this was built for research purposes, not for an actual farm. Uh, this was electric motor driven, the, the, the feed uh, to, to distribute the seed down the row units. Not the end of the world, you can make that work. We certainly did. We would prefer it to be wheel driven if we were gonna do it again uh, because we had to do a lot more math. You know, we had to figure out what speed we wanted to go in the field and then you had to stick to that speed. Uh, so if you got in a muddy spot, you got in some tight corners, you're, you're either gonna be putting more seed out than you wanted or you're gonna be maybe crashing into a fence. Pick what you wanna do. Um, but there's other options, and I'm not promoting Gandhi or anything, but they, they have some other options that a lot of farmers are using in the area um, as well. But there, there's plenty of other options now. But this was just to kind of show you guys, you know, for not a lot of money, you can get your own interceder if you really want to. And this can be scaled up or scaled down. Uh, another issue with this setup so these brackets came with the Gandhi boxes to put on the seed. But you'll notice when we had four uh, row units attached to that box, these outer rows, this tube tended to dip a little bit. And on those smaller seeds, they tended to get caught in that tube. Because this isn't air driven. It's not an air driven system, it's this gravity flow down. So that was a problem. So if you're gonna go with, if you're thinking about something like this, um, we would rather see something that's air driven or maybe we wouldn't put as many rows per box which then you got to buy more boxes so just a couple of things i want people to be aware of if you're ever thinking about replicating something like this i think i covered just looking at my notes yep okay so are there Maybe now's a good time. Are there any questions about this? If well, I'll take a few questions now and then we'll move on to the roller crimper. All right, we'll move on. Oh, I should mention, this is what we're, my friend Mike, who, who basically built most of this project, this is what he's able to do in his fields. Um, you see he was pretty successful in his corn fields. And this was in the middle of the summer, late summer. Um, you know, that the interseeding of that cover crop worked really well. And like I said, we're entomologists, so we studied the insects and we were looking at beneficial insects. That's a lady beetle larva, uh, which are ferocious predators of aphids and other herbivores of a lot of our, our crops we grow. And he was finding a lot more predators on the soil surface in that in that in those fields. So not only did the interseeder do its job, but the cover crop that was out there also was doing its job in attracting more beneficial insects. So that's, that's a sidebar. I won't get into that too much because uh, that's not what we're here for today. The main project, and this is the roller crimper project. So at the lab that I work in, Ecdysis Foundation, we we meet with a lot of farmers and we bring them in for coffee clubs and they were running into this problem. They, they loved the idea of cover crops. They were either having to choose to spray them out in the spring, disc them under, or they wanted to roll or crimp it. And the problem was there weren't a lot of available roller crimpers in our area. Number two, it was kind of a new technology to them so they weren't sure they wanted to pay the thirty thousand dollar price tag to purchase their own and fortunately a lot of those farmers that were meeting with us for these coffee clubs were professional welders on the side or retired uh, machinists and uh, so they had a lot of good skills and they started looking at the roller crimper uh, looking at some of the rodale plans actually they said, this is a pretty simple machine. We think we can build one. And we just got to figure out, you know, something we can use and how to mount, you know, 
crimping drums onto a piece of machinery. And that's where my friend Mike and I came in and we said, well, sorry, am I blocking your guys' view? <laughs> um, and we said, I think we could pull some money together for you guys and, and help to build this machine for not, not a whole lot of cash. And that's where Sarah came in. We got the partnership grant from Sarah to work with, work with them to build this machine. So this one's, we documented this uh, pretty extensively. And, and fortunately we got the grant and part of that grant was, um, Sarah said, it, it was in their stipulations, you're not allowed to spend like more than $5,000 on equipment. And we kind of countered that and said, well, the equipment is the project for this. Can we go a little bit more? And so they let us go up to $6,000. So that was our goal. Build a roller crimper for $6,000 in materials. Uh, and, and I'll let you guys know at the end if we accomplish that. But we got the grant to get going and we said, um, what do we need first? We need to figure out what to use uh, for our frame. We needed to gather our supplies, start building our drums for the crimper, mount those drums to our frame, and then test the thing out. And, you know, for anybody that's a bit intimidated by building something on their own, like I said, I'd never taken a shop class before. I'd never even touched a welder in my life. This is the basic layout of what you do. It's, there's not a lot of steps to it. And we'll work through some of the minutia today. So the crimper frame, there it is. That's what we purchased. This is a international 490 disc. I wonder if this thing works. Nope. Uh, and the reason we picked this disc, there are several reasons. One, it was a pull behind. Uh, we thought of that as we're exchanging this between all kinds of farmers in the area because all the participating farmers are allowed to use it. Uh, it had a three wing full design, so it made it easy to transport along the roads. And it also was uh, about the right size for farmers in our area. Uh, this was a 24 foot disc. And I should note, if you need to scale down, if you have a smaller uh, land and you want something smaller, just get a smaller piece of machinery. It's really easy. If you need something bigger, go bigger. But we liked this because I called around to a lot of the dealership, the, the implement dealerships in our area. I could not find a disc for sale that was in our budget. And, and one of the guys said, actually a few of them said, the reason you're not finding anything in your size range is because we don't deal on anything less than 30 feet. It has no trade-in value anymore in our area in Brookings, South Dakota. Um, so he said, you can probably find a disc in somebody's tree line for scrap metal prices. Uh, go do that. And so basically we adjusted our search to something less than 30 feet because we can get it at scrap price. And that's where we found this, this 490 disc. It was sit it had been sitting in the shed. It hadn't been used for a number of years. It had a really nice heavy duty frame. It was over engineered for the purposes of a roller crimper because it's meant to be tilling and kind of torqued on a bit as you're, you're disking your field. And then last thing, if, as you're looking for your piece of equipment, look for something that's been well maintained because it's going to really reduce your repair costs because like I said, we got our disc for scrap price. It was 1500 bucks. We had to put a few new tires on it, uh, re-grease the bearings, put a few new hydraulic hoses on it, and we had a working piece of machinery for 25, 2600 bucks. So now that we had our equipment, we had our frame, it's now time to start working on it. This is Mike, and he made his, I always found this funny, he's using the power uh, torque wrench He's making his wife use the handheld one. Um, I don't know why he did that. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he did all the work getting this thing cleaned up uh, and, and getting the new tires on and getting it stripped down and ready to go. Basically, you just got to take off those disc gangs. 
Uh, and there it is, all ready to go down the road. So, now I'm going to talk to you guys. This is the, probably the most complicated design part of our whole project. But we're going to work through this. That's a lot for the purposes of, we've already worked through all the math. So if you guys want to, you can contact me. And I can give you all these numbers. Uh, this is what works for us for our crimper design. So on our drums, the drums that spin and crimp the crop, Typically what you'll see on the commercial made ones is they're a chevron pattern, those blades that come around the drums, they're a V-shape like that. That was really complicated for us to produce in a farm shop. And we're working with local farmers to do this. So we went with straight blades. So the, our blades were about two feet roughly. Actually, in this case, you'll see we had three drums because our, our disc folded so each wing wing drum on the side we measured what we needed and we decided each blade that's sitting straight across the drum is going to be 20 in, 20 and three quarters of an inch long and then we'll put one blade on the drum like that and then we'll overlap the next blade a few inches apart so that we don't have one long blade running the entire drum so that they're offset and I'll show you guys a photo of that in a little bit. So we have four rows, one, two, three, four, of our straight blades. And the reason we did that, if you put them all straight across, it would shake your machine to death. Like it would pull itself apart. So it would just rattle too much. So this kind of makes, helps to make it run smoother. And our wing drums, we had four rows, and that was the length of each blade. Our center drum, in the middle of that disc was 11 rows and this is what the math worked out to be to make that fit on our 11 foot center drum. Now here's a side view of those drums and what you'll see here the marks shown in black that's one row like this row right here the gray ones are the other offset row and to go all the way around we did the math and we figured we needed e essentially 11 rows to go around. And here's the distances between that. This was on a drum that is 16 inches outside diameter. So the outside diameter of this drum. That's what we used. The reason we picked 16 inches is because we went to a commercial drill, or excuse me, a commercial roller crimper and measured how, how wide there's. We're not engineers we're not going to reinvent the wheel if it's good enough for them it's good enough for us how thick is the wall on the drum five sixteenths yep and yeah I'll, I'll mention the drums here in a second like where we found them and stuff like that yeah because there are some quirks in that too the blades are i think they we use quarter inch uh we'll cover that here in a second too yeah uh and they're four inches tall uh, so, and the, if you guys are, if you don't have access to a, access to a 16 inch drum, you can adjust this. Uh, and the way we figured out if this would roll smooth, we literally took a piece of cardboard, cut out a 16 inch circle, and started taping um, barbecue skewer, skewers, like the wooden skewers you put on the grill, around it that represented these. And then we just rolled it across the floor and we played around with the 10 blade, 11 blade, and 12 blade. And we just said 11 was the smoothest for, for what you get out of it. That's where we came up with it from. So if you, if you don't like that, you, you're more than welcome to tweak that. But that was smooth enough for us and it made sense. Also on each of these blades, there's a gusset and that gives it some support. These were, these were our gussets as well. So this, we did this intentionally at the beginning because that Figured, helped us figure out our supply, supply list. So here's our supply list of stuff. This is all you need to, pur to purchase to build a dr uh, crimper like ours. Okay, good. We're doing good on time. So, like we said, the, the steel tubes we found in a scrapyard again. We had to do this on the cheap. 16-inch uh, outside diameter. 5 16th inch uh, thickness. 
the one thing to look for if you're going this route and you're looking at scrap yards and stuff, there sometimes is uneven wear in the tubes. So the inside diameter might not be exactly equal all the way around. Uh, that's something to look for uh, and try and get it as even as you can. The reason ours were a tinge bit uneven, the, the scrap yard owner said he thought these came out of the oil fields in North Dakota, so they were just laying horizontal and, and stuff was getting pushed, pushed through them. So there's, you know, the bottom portion was a little bit more worn. Uh, but on the good news is these were, we could find these everywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, we, that scrapyard didn't have enough of us, but one of the local farmers just happened to have one that he purchased for another project laying around. He didn't use the whole thing, so we, we, we bought the excess from him. So they're pretty ubiquitous, at least in our area around Brookings in eastern South Dakota. Um, so that's where we sourced that material. Next is the steel plates, the things that we use for the blades on the crimper and those gussets. And on this part, we did not go to the scrap yards. And the reason being, we would be looking forever to find enough material. So we just went to a warehouse, Max Steel in Watertown is who we purchased our stuff from. We really liked it um, because it also had the advantage of they cut everything to the exact length that we needed. So we didn't have to sit there with a chop saw cutting steel bars to length. Uh, it made it really easy added almost no cost to it for us. Uh, and this was, yeah, quarter inch thick blades, four inches wide, and then I showed you what the lengths were for the different wings and drums earlier, or the center and wing drums earlier. Uh, our gussets that we used were three inches tall, uh, same quarter inch thickness again, and inch and a half on the bottom. And on those gussets, if you do get them pre-cut from your supplier, uh, sometimes they have these little tags on the end and that was really annoying to us because they're meant to butt up right against those blades uh, and those tags you know gave just enough of a play it was hard to weld so we had to sit there and grind all those tags off uh, just something to look for as you're as you're trying to manage and get ready for a project like this it's a, it's an extra little step takes some time to do not that hard though so our center drum was 11 foot wide, 60, that required 66 blades. Wing drums were six foot eight inches wide. That required 88 blades or 48, 44 blades for each wing. <clears throat> okay, your next supplies you're gonna need, your steel bars right here. Those are the axle for your drum. So here we've kind of mounted our our blades and we run this axle. We ran our axles completely through the entire drum. We didn't cut them off and put a, put a plate inside to, to hold them in there. We just ran it. The reason being, we're not engineers. We weren't sure what kind of strength we need and we figured an axle that runs all the way through is simpler for us to put in. It makes it straight all the way across and it's going to give it a little bit more rigidity in that center drum as i'll show in a moment here we actually put an extra support system in the middle and that axle held it in place so here's the measurements on on these steel bars uh inch and three quarter diameter the center drum was 12 foot in length because we had an 11 foot center drum and we went two feet extra on each wing the reason we went so much extra on the wings is they kind of came in handy as handles, essentially, to move this thing around. Uh, and then we cut off the excess when we were all done. <clears throat> steel plates. Uh, we needed some more steel to cap the ends of our drums. The reason we wanted them capped is because we fill them with water for extra weight on the machine. And, uh, and it served as a place to hold these axles. Uh, half inch thick steel uh, cut to the inside diameter of whatever your tube is and the reason I said you know pay attention to wear on those tubes inside wear because our tubes definitely had some inside wear on them and not every tube had the same diameter so we had to measure each one specifically so we had a specific piece of steel to put a cap on the end uh, wasn't that hard it's just something 
as you're doing this. If you're purchasing, purchasing stuff from scrapyards, it's not always perfect how, they, how it's, uh, it is when you get it from a warehouse. So, yeah, that's, that's one thing to note on those. All right, your next supply thing, your steel tubes. We needed some more square steel tubing, and this was to build, this was essentially to hang these brackets from, which then hung on our wings, you'll see it right there, so that the, the drum could hang from, from our disc. So this we did get from a, it was in the tree line, it's an old international planter. So that toolbar was just scrap metal price again, seven by seven inches. Um, it doesn't have to be seven by seven, yeah. On that, just looking on a disc like this, it's normally set this way, but did you run those lowers this way? Yeah, that's why we had the yoke, or that's why we got this part, because our disc frame, like you said, the center is, you know, running straight, and then those, that frame kind of angles a little bit. We needed it to be straight, otherwise we're going to be pulling at an angle. It would be weird. So we used this and then made that perpendicular with our frame so that it would pull. Everything pulled straight. Exactly. Did you use for a single roller or daughter double? Uh, we had three rollers on the machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they overlapped two inches. You know, from the center is in the front, and the wings were in the back, and those those back ones overlap two inches on each side. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> uh, the next thing you need here is these steel brackets. Again, the same place we got the steel plates from to cap the ends of the drums. We purchased these, this, this uh, steel right here. This is half inch again. And these are the brackets that we made this is the pieces that we originally intended to make it out of. So these are the measurements to, for our brackets. This is five inches tall. I didn't put that in there. Um, and two inches wide to accommodate that inch and three quarter axle coming in. Uh, but you'll notice on ours, it's kind of hard to see in this small screen, ours is rolled. Instead of welding those three pieces together, you know, this is the back here, this, is the side and then this is the top plate where we attach it to our toolbar. Ours is rolled because the local manufacturer that were purchased, they had scrap steel, you know, they had extra laying around. They said, we'll, we'll just cut the thing and roll it for you and won't charge you. Um, but you don't have to do that. This would work just fine if you just welded those pieces together and made your own brackets. So. Now we've got our frame, we've got our design for it, we've got all our supplies, it's now time to start putting this thing together. Uh, the most time consuming part by far for us was putting these drums together. Remember when I said earlier, you know, a part of our design to figure out where our rows were going to go and what was going to roll smooth, I said we used cardboard and, and skewers. That actually came in handy, we used that to mark on our tubes, our drum tubes, where our rows were gonna go. We basically used that as the template to mark where the rows, we'd make little marks all the way around our drum and then snap a chalk line. And then we had a nice chalk line, it might be hard to see here, but here's our chalk line of where to mount our blades. So that was really handy. If you're thinking about building something similar to us, I would really consider making this template uh, like that. And it, it just took, it took Mike a couple hours in his kitchen to build that. Okay, so now that you have your, all your, your, your drums marked up, you need your blades and the first thing to make your blades is you should tack your gussets to it. it takes a long time, but it's an easy job. Uh, and then you tack those blades to your drum, and then you put on your finishing welds on your drum. So this is an easy job, it just takes a long time. So you, the, that's the, the one of the shortfalls of the straight blade design. You see where they're going on there, and then we have an offset row. These are overlapped by an inch, this row to in, this row. 
this requires a lot of welds. If you have access to somebody that can cut that chevron pattern to build your blades out of, it takes way less welding. Uh, just, so that's just something to be aware of. Uh, I'm not saying the chevron's bad. I, I would much rather, pref I would have preferred it when I was sitting in the shop for hours welding this. Uh, but this is easier to do, uh, at least for us, it was. So you had your blades on, it's now time to start putting your steel plates uh, and capping your drums. So. The wing drums are easy. We just capped each side of them and welded it uh, around. The, the center drum, because it was 11 feet long and, it, uh, it was so, and we run our axle all the way through it, we were concerned about it you know, vibrating a bit and maybe snapping at some point. So we wanted to add a little bit more structure to it. So we put a steel plate in the center of our center drum, the 11 foot long drum. And Remember, we want water to flow through it, so we cut out notches in our steel plate. Three notches was good enough, and just welded it right to the center of that axle bar. Yeah. So no, it's it's welded to the and the way we did that is we actually cut. We took a torch, and we cut little rectangles in the center of our drum, out of the drum. So we took out little rectangles and then slid our axle in where that steel plate lined up in the middle of that drum uh, with those little, those little cutouts. And then we did plug welds to fill it in. So it's, it's, it's in there. Yep, thank you. Okay, and then you cap the ends of your drums like I showed earlier. This is a step that's handy to have a friend because you kind of need one person to help you. One person's got a buddy on each side to push in those caps. So you, you do need a buddy on that step a little bit. Uh, at the end of it, there's a drum. There's our 11 foot drum. Um, you'll see, yeah, there you can see the offset rows a little bit nicer on that, on that photo. But you also see all the welds it took yeah, you're welding the gussets, the blades in several spots, and you're welding around the, all those gussets and stuff. It's a lot of welding. Yeah? Do you think you could have had the blades rolled at the end, like an inch and a half or something, instead of putting gussets on the end? Could you, would it work sure. if you rolled the blades? I think so. I think so. Um, I don't see any, any problem with that. This was just uh, something we had access to, because uh, uh, they could chop those blades for us at the warehouse. I don't know if they would have rolled the ends for us if they would have been so kind to do that. But yeah, certainly. Okay, now you got your drums. It's time to put them on the disc frame. Again, I will stress having a template. Here's a template of, that, of our bracket that we talked about earlier. Just a stiff piece of paper or cardboard I used and just cut it to the same dimensions and we kind of blocked, we just blocked our drum in place and, and figured out where we could affix the brackets so that the drum hung low enough, but we weren't gonna mess with the articulation of that wing coming down. Uh, that was really important on that center drum. And I should mention here, we had the advantage in our shop, we were working in, one of our farmers had a welding business on the side. So he had an overhead winch, which made it really easy because these things are so stinking heavy. You can't, you can't pick one up with yourself or just a few guys. So we had an overhead winch. If you don't have that, uh, a skid steer worked really well to move these around as well. Uh, so you do need to consider something to help you move this around. The overhead winch really helped us get into position, but that was a luxury. You don't have to have that. A skid steer would work just fine with some, some pallet forks, I should say. Yeah. So we did that. We measured it twice like you're supposed to. Luckily, Seth. Seth is one of our local farmers who, who's a professional welder, was making sure we did all that right. And then there's our center drum sitting in the middle of our disc frame there. And we were darn fortunate. 
it rolled super smooth. It didn't have any vibrations or anything. So I don't know if we're lucky or the, our local farmers really looked out for us, but it worked out pretty well. So that's the center drum. That's the easier one to attach. Now it's time to look at the wing drums. And like the question was earlier, we have the issue on the, that disc frame that we chose. It's an angle out the frame. And we, if we were just to put the brackets where the disc games used to be, our, disc drum, our crimper drum would be at an angle. So we'd be pulling straight with the center drum and the, the wing ones would be at an angle which would be a bit of a problem. Uh, it would be some torque that we wouldn't want. So we wanted something that would sit perpendicular to that frame so our, our rollers would roll straight along with that center one. So the wings and the center would all roll straight forward. So we needed some kind of steel tubing. There's our old oh, international planter that we pulled out from the hay pile, removed all the stuff, cut it to length that we needed. Uh, and we started looking at how to mount. And this was the trickiest part of the whole project. We brought out the whole crew, even the supervisor, Cat, uh, had a lot of wisdom. Uh, but, but we spent a lot of time measuring all this, like where are we gonna put this? Because you see, this is that angle part that the original disc gang was on, and that just wouldn't work for us. And we had to put it straight, you know, straight uh, so that it rolled, the whole thing rolled together forward straight. And the tough part about it is there's not a lot of space because this has to overlap the center drum, which the, di the original disc gang design did not have to do. So we had to find enough space in there to squeeze all this in as well as avoiding these, the tires there. So we basically put the tires back in the most awkward position possible, the, where they're the furthest back, and then we just started making measurements. And we said, this is the least optimal place for these tires to be. Can we still fit our drums in there? So we just started measuring uh, until we, we found the right spot. And there's not a lot of space, but it is doable, you'll see. And then once we'd figured that out, we just used that to bark you know, where we wanted it, because we wanted to sit this on top like a yoke, you know, like oxen yoke. We, we didn't want to just weld it to the top of the frame. We want to sit down a little bit. So we marked our, and we cut little notches out of it so that it could sit and give it a little more strength as we were pulling it, and we weren't worried about it falling off. There's Seth um, cutting their notches out for us. And then welded the brackets onto it. Sorry, went through a little fast. Get out of the way for everyone. And then clamp the thing on where we had marked before when we figured out and put our welds on. Uh, there's Mike. He was pretty proud at this point. That was our hardest part. And then you just set the thing down once you got your yoke. See how this yoke, this is our toolbar, seven by seven toolbar. We just cut notches out of it so that it came down even or flush with our disc frame right here. That's probably hard to see, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but then we just set the whole thing down on our drums and attached our bearings and we had a crimper. And Mike was pretty happy that day. <laughs> uh, but it, it rolled really, we were like, oh, it rolled so stinking smooth for us. We were pretty excited because, again, we didn't know what we were doing. So the next thing was to test the thing real quick here. So this is our first field. This was a stand of volunteer rye. So you notice it's really thin. But a, one of our local farmers that we had been working with quite a bit, he wanted to turn it back into a pasture, so he didn't care what, what we did. He just wanted to set back the rye a little bit. And we wanted to know if it would roll in the field fast enough uh, and not fall apart. So we ran it out there. It rolled really smooth, really well. So we started advertising that we had this roller crimper and we wanted to test it on a real cover crop. So a gentleman gave us a call. He had said he had a nice stand of, of rye that he wanted gone and he was an organic guy. And so he would prefer not to, to, to till it. Uh, so he, 
he's, he came and grabbed our crimper from us. You'll see it did a pretty good job, you know, but like with all tools, it's not perfect. It's not a silver bullet. He had some weeds in this field. It's not going to kill those weeds. So don't expect it to be this magical tool. I'm sure most of you guys know that. But we did have some other farmers that would use it for other things. Uh, one guy had a large patch of Canadian thistles uh, that he wanted to let go. He wanted to let bloom because he was a beekeeper, but he didn't want to let it go to seed because he wanted to be a good neighbor. And so he came and borrowed the crimper. And in his words, you know, after all the thistles had bloomed, he said it destroyed the thistles. It just snapped them off because they have that nice hollow stem on them when they're at that growth stage. And I was tired of these weeds uh, back behind the lab. So I decided I wanted to use the crimper one day to take out those weeds. So it, it's a nice, it's been a nice piece of equipment for us to play around with. And farmers, we've had seven farmers borrow it now. Uh, they've all reported uh, it rolls really well, performed uh, up to their expectations. Uh, it's not perfect. You'll notice here on that original design, these blades should crimp every six and a half inches or so. So you should see a crimp in the rye every uh, six and a half inches. Our machine at first, before we added um, uh, bung holes to add weight into the tubes, it wasn't quite heavy enough, so it wasn't crimping very well. So it was more like 12 inches. So it was every other one. It wasn't working quite right. Uh, so we added water, and this last year, the three farmers that borrowed it from us said it worked much better. It had the weight to crimp uh, a substantial rye, rye crop. Yeah? Did you ever pull it over a scale and see how much it weighs? Uh, I get that question every time, and we have not. No, no. I'm not sure how much it weighs. Sorry. But I, the, one of the reasons we originally didn't have the ability to put water in at first is because we were hoping that that disc frame was just heavy enough. You know, it's heavier than your typical commercially built crimpers. But, so it's a little heavier than that, but it's, it wasn't heavy enough, so we had to add water. Uh, oh, and at the beginning I mentioned, you know, this project, our goal was to keep it under $6,000 in materials, and that was our total for the whole project. So $5,853, not including labor. I will tell you our labor total for Myself, Mike, the ranchers and farmers that helped us to build it. The time total to build it was 178 hours. And we're hoping, you know, we didn't know what we were doing so that um, to make it easier for folks if they ever want to build this, we're in the process of building a how-to video series. So you don't have to sit there and scratch your heads to figure out how to do this. You can learn from our mistakes and kind of, if you want to, you can just steal our plants. That's what it's here for. Um, and and I, it's also available, the report on this is available through SARE's website as well. It's a partnership grant. Just go on to the North Central SARE's website and look for uh, DIY roller crimper. and It'll pull this one up. Uh, like I said, we, I'm the only one here today talking about it, but there's a lot of people that helped on this. Uh, believe me, I couldn't have done it myself. So if you have any questions, if you want you know, the measurements I showed, if you didn't have time to jot them down as I was flying through slides, send me an email um, and I'll be happy to, to send you measurements on this thing and how we did stuff. So uh, I think we have a couple minutes for questions, if, if, if anyone's got any. Yeah? Were those blades, did they go into the soil too? They usually, if you have a thick stand of cover crops, they don't. But the people that have thin stands, they do dig a little bit. It's never been to the point we had a guy that had, that it's hurt anything. He had soybeans that were in like the, uh, like V2 stage, V3, somewhere in there. He went over it and it dug a little bit. It didn't hurt his soybeans at all. So it, I don't know how it miraculously missed them, but it did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it uh, it can if you don't have a real thick stand of stuff. Yeah, yeah. The thicker the stand, the better. Though. Yeah, it, exactly. If the thicker the stand, the better for crimping cover crops anyway. And pretty yeah. much all the rye died after you did that. Pretty much, um, I'd say we had about 
95, 96% kill. Uh, where we had problems with it, and again, this is just a tool, it's not a perfect machine, um, is where the rye, the cover crops were a little thinner, where they had thin stands. That's where it just doesn't, I don't know why, maybe if anybody knows or understands that, why it doesn't crimp as well in thin stands, but. It's the math. Yeah, uh, pulling it, pulling, it pulling it itself down. And I think, yeah. I think the thicker is too, the stems are a little thinner. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, the the rye, you know, you're crimping the rye at a certain growth stage where it's vulnerable to be, uh, that, you know, having its stem bent like that. Uh, whereas the other weeds, either they're not at the right growth stage, or or maybe they're they're lower growing. They don't have that long stalk, so it's not going to crimp that kind of stuff. Because uh, if they're at the wrong growth stage, it'll just bounce right back. Because yeah. the thicker it is, it'll help push it. Yeah. Push it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it kind of intertwines too when you have that thick mat. Yeah. Do you think it would work going right onto a land roller? That's originally what we wanted to use uh, for this. We were like, let's just buy a land roller and put blades on it. Problem was, we couldn't, we called around all the salvage yards. Again, we only had $6,000. Uh, they said, you're not going to find a land roller in that price range because they're all rusted out at that point. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're also much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if you can find one, go go for it. Yeah. Did you have a chance to use it in rocks? Rocks, yes. Uh, definitely. Because when we got it back this year, I went to the one gentleman's field after he brought it back, because all our blades they're a little bit bent. We're like, what what's going on? He goes, I have a few rocks in my field. I went to his field, he had rocks everywhere didn't knock off a single blade. It, it actually bent the steel in some spots, but it didn't break one off. Yeah. 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 Do you think if the blades were thicker, they would crimp, they wouldn't do as good a job crimping? Like, is there any reason mm -hmm. why the blades couldn't be three eighths or half inch? Um, yeah, I would be a little bit concerned if it would have enough, if it would have enough, like, a point you know you're putting all that weight of the machine on those blades at one time and if you start widening those blades you run the potential of distributing that weight a little a little wider I think that's why that would be my concern is it you know because it's it, it's not all um, straight across the weight mm -hmm. it yeah well i think that one also rolls a little smoother doesn't it is it not yeah. if i'm if i'm incorrect yeah were those blades sharpened or not nope just quarter inch straight from the manufacturer. I mean, they had a nice sharp edge to them, but we didn't sharpen an edge on it. No. Yeah, yeah, it'd be like a quarter inch right. But when it first comes in contact with stuff, it'd be that corner of those blades. Yeah. And yeah, it'd be the edge of that. Yeah. If you want to crimp, you don't want to cut. What's that? You, you want to just crimp them, you don't want to cut them. No, yeah, exactly. Because you're trying to lay it over. You don't want to have it cut all up. And this machine doesn't crimp it or doesn't cut it, except for that thistle example where the where the guy was running over his thistle field. Yeah. Uh, two, two questions. The speed that worked seemed to work the best, and how much water did you add? The speed that worked the best, they were running it from around eight to nine miles an hour, uh, and how much water they added, we didn't have a poundage. He filled it up three quarters on each tube. Yep. And did you drain it before you left them? Uh, yeah, yeah, especially when we went down the road. When he was just traveling from one field to the next, about a half mile away, he did not. He lifted it up uh, full. But when we went down the road, we drained them all. Tongue wave when you do that with the water. Is it negative tongue wave, positive tongue wave? Or? Oh, I don't even understand. Like what? So, like, sorry. Uh, so when you fill it with water, you know, obviously your weight disbursement oh. could be forwards or backwards. Sure. Because you, know, you want some weight on your tongue, but not yep. too much. And yeah. So like, that, that when we filled them with water, as long as we, as long as we filled them pretty evenly, it still had just uh, enough weight to put some pressure on the tongue. But it was. When I 
when we didn't have any water in it, it was pretty well balanced because when I lean on the back of it, I can flip the machine up. Uh, so it's, it's, it's right on the edge. But it must not have been too bad because you had a picture of it and pulled it up, not hooked up to a tractor. So it yeah, it, it wants to sit forward on the tongue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's your uh, position of the actual rollers in relation to the actual machine itself? Is it very centered or like you have the middle crimper, I think, is really far forward and the wings are yeah. The, the middle, the center one is pretty far forward, uh, and the, the wing ones are pretty well all the way back. There, it's, we mimicked basically where the, the disc gains were at, or pretty closely. Yeah. Was one inch overlap enough? If I were going to do it again, I'd go more than one inch. Yeah. Good point. Because it seemed like sometimes when there wasn't a thick stand where they are pulling themselves together and it was a real windy day, we'd have just a thin strip you could look down the field, and that's where we didn't get good crimping. So I would like to see it higher. But the problem we were running into, we were concerned about when it's folding down, that wing's folding down, it's quite a bit bigger than those disc gangs were, and it's hanging down. We didn't want it to scrape on the ground. so. The further in you put those, the more chance you run of it scraping. But after doing it now, I think we had more space than we thought. We just we're just dumb entomologists, you know. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's who you're working with. There, there's plenty of room for improvement. Uh, and if you guys, if anybody decides to do this, let me know. I'd love to see what you what you produce and what you learn about it. Uh, so that we can keep adding to that report for Sarah because people do check that out and we'd like to, to add some knowledge gain to that. Did you ever uh, notice that you use that the tire tracks from the tractor to do the Oh, I didn't notice that. I'm trying to think. I want to make sure. I never ran across that. I guess, especially in the thick fields. But I could see that being maybe in a muddy field if somebody had that where the tire tracks get a little more depressed. But that's one of the reasons we wanted to add water is because we were running into issues of some uneven terrain, you know, like little bumps, little hills in your field. And it wasn't getting down in those divots as well. So yeah, that's why we added the extra weight. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I could, I could see that happening. Yeah. I, I've heard that from three guys that do a lot of roller crimping that they say you have to have a front mount. Really? And if you want a wider implement, then you pull one behind two. Oh, you interesting. Because interesting. the tire tracks always come back, especially. Yeah, sure. I, I think Harry Vetch is really bad done. Okay. One, one tip I should say, we talked to a guy in Kansas who had built his own two, and he said to really get good crimping on his rye, he would figure out which direction he wanted his you know, soybeans to go the next year, it, and he would plant his rye at a 45 de degree angle to those soybean rows. So then when he was coming back crimping over the soybeans, he'd be following his soybean rows, but the rye was at a 45 degree angle. And he said he got a lot better crimping action that way because he's going at a 45 degree angle to his rye. That's just one guy's story. Uh, I didn't see it for myself, so take it for what it's worth, but he, he swore by it. So that's, yeah. Oh, have you? Okay. Okay. Or even perpendicular to the rows. Sure. Yeah. 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 So that's just one tip. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Were they crimping after they had the soybeans drilled? Yeah. Uh, most of the folks we worked with, they already had their soybeans in. They planted green uh, into the rye. Right into the rye and then crimped yep. It yep, crimped it afterwards. Yeah. Even one guy was trying corn. He planted corn into his rye. Um, he had pretty bad yield on that, but. He also was in a, we were in a pretty good drought last year too. So uh, two years ago, he had great success with that. So, yeah. 
Excellent. Well, how yeah. Many, oh, how go many ahead. days do you think the beans had been in before they? How many days? I don't know. I don't know if I could say because some guy, like I said, we were in a drought last year, so some guys had planted them and they'd just been sitting under the ground for a while. Um, I think the University of Wisconsin has a lot of research on, they've done a lot of good work uh, as far as what stage the beans can I don't, be. I don't, yeah, I think you go by stage, you don't really go by days. Yeah. It's like they're, they're planting their beans at food stage or maybe a minute before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. then, and then they wait until the rye is fully in that piece. Is, yeah. You know, almost done shit it's all so yeah perfect. yeah that's when you get your best results from it yeah it, it's just a matter of getting the timing of the beans and the rye all together that's the tricky part with this this kind of a system I think if you can plant in the rain when it's like nice thick rye that's true yeah yeah well good um, I'll be around for a while uh, you can always get a hold of me if I want to be respectful of of our our time here okay okay but yeah thank you guys love the questions